Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing cellular necrosis. Now, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel because we're posting brand new educational content for your medical education, for your exams, and for your uh, board examinations as well in order to help you succeed so you don't have to go more into debt. So with that being said, this is going to be part one of our necrosis series, or of our cellular necrosis series, excuse me, and there are going to be subsequent parts coming up. We're going to start off this conversation, this lecture, by first discussing cellular injury because you should have a basic understanding of what's happening when we're talking about cell injury in terms of uh, the whole pathology behind cellular necrosis. So the main thing you need to remember is that our cells have the ability to adapt to certain levels of stress via multiple mechanisms, whether it's hyperplasia, whether it's hypertrophy, or it's metaplasia. And the type of adaptation is going to be dependent on the type of cell, it's going to be dependent on the type of stress, as well as the severity of the stress itself. Now, what happens when the amount of stress exceeds our cells' ability to adapt? You are going to have cellular injury in that, in that situation. So cell injury occurs when the amount of cell that the, uh, the, the amount of stress a cell can handle is, is far exceeding the cell's ability to adapt. Okay, so the amount of stress placed upon a cell, excuse me, is far exceeding the cell's ability to adapt, aka there's just too much stress on that cell, it's not able to function properly, even with its adaptive mechanisms like hyperplasia, hypertrophy, and even metaplasia. Now, there's going to be more, many different ranges of injury that can occur from very slight injury to very large wide scale injury. And that's also, again, going to be dependent on the type of cell, the severity of the, the, the stress and the type of stress. But the cellular damage is made mainly going to occur in two stages. The first stage is going to be reversible cellular injury, which is characterized by cell swelling. The cell is going to grow in size because you are going to stop the sodium potassium pumps, which is going to cause an increase of intracellular sodium. Okay. And that means you are also going to have an increase in the intracellular water concentration simply because water follows sodium. Right, but what happens if the at this stage, at the reversible injury stage, you continuously apply stress? Well, our cell will then progress to the irreversible uh, injury stage, where you're going to have membrane damage occurring, not only at the cellular level, but also at the organelle level, at the mitochondria and the lysosomes. So we've discussed this in previous lectures. You can definitely check that out. All of this content in this slide has actually been. Uh, um, presented in several different lectures on our account. So definitely go check them out. But what happens essentially when you get the cell damage occurring? What happens in order for our cells to be dying off on a massive scale? Well, that is where we discuss cellular necrosis, right? Keep in mind, this is the simplified pathway of cell injury from a normal cell. You can progress to the reversible cell injury uh, state and that's why we have dual arrows here. But if you do not remove stress uh, or if you do not reduce the amount of stress that's being placed upon a cell where the injury is occurring, that reversible stage is going to progress to the irreversible and eventually it will lead to cell death. Now that, now that we've covered the cell injury portion, the, a quick re, uh, review of that concept, let's move forward. Let's talk about cell necrosis, which is the topic of this whole lecture. So cell necrosis, like I was saying earlier, is death of cells on a large scale. This is very important. This is very high yield because this is a key differentiating factor from cell apoptosis and from other mechanisms. Large scale meaning this is occurring at the tissue level, not at the molecular or the uh, cellular level. Now, usually cell necrosis occurs because of an exogenous cell injury, right? An external injury that results in uncontrolled cellular degradation. Now, what could this injury be? Honestly, it could really be anything that's going on. It could be damage. It could be trauma. It could be literally anything other than internal insults. Okay, so in this situation, the normal cellular enzymes that are, con that are responsible for controlled cell death, aka apoptosis, are inactivated. They are not working. Okay. And the reason why is because this exogenous injury right here that we're discussing is just leading to massive cell die off or cell death occurring. And the intracellular controls don't need to be activated. They are not going to really be able to do anything because the cells are probably dying too fast for those control mechanisms to catch up. Now, a lot of times cell necrosis is going to be due to underlying pathologic process. And like I said, this could be anything. This could be an infection. Okay, 
This could just be a traumatic injury. Okay, this could also just be inflammation. Inflammation plays an important role in cell necrosis, which we're about to talk about right now. So the key principles of cell necrosis is that when you have this massive uh, damage occurring at the tissue level, your cells are going to release those intracellular components. Remember, like I said in the previous uh, slide, the irreversible cellular injury stage is characterized by membrane damage occurring at the cellular and at the organelle level. So when that damage occurs at the, at the, the membranes, the intracellular components are going to be released into the extracellular space. Right. And when that happens, when you have the intracellular components in the extracellular space, you are going to attract what you are going to attract white blood cells. Right. And what do white blood cells do really well? Well, they cause inflammation. So another key principle or key hallmark presentation of cell necrosis is the presence of inflammation. Because those white blood cells are noticing something is not right. We see these intracellular components outside where they should not be. So maybe there's some problem going on and we need to rapidly respond. And we need to cause inflammation to kill off whatever underlying patholo pathologic process is going on. The white blood cells might not be able to differentiate at that moment whether it's trauma, whether it's an infection, or if, if it's just general inflammation. All they see is this pathologic condition and they need to respond really quickly to save your life, even though it's going to cause more damage in the short term. So that is essentially what cell necrosis is going on. Now, when it comes to cell necrosis, we can further distinguish cell necrosis based off of the type of cell necrosis that is occurring. OK, and there's several different types you need to know. All of these are very high yield and I like to write high yield AF. So you commit this to memory. They're very high yield because they're going to be tested on. It's very easy to quiz you on the type of cell necrosis that's happening by asking you, hey, this is the condition. This is the clinical vignette. What type of cell necrosis is most likely occurring in this patient? Or they could even say this is the type of cell necrosis. Explain the underlying pathologic condition and they'll give you multiple uh, multiple answers and you have to pick the right one, right? So when it comes to these different types of cell necrosis uh, pathways or differentiations, we have six main types you need to know. In this lecture, we're going to be covering the first three, okay, which are coagulative necrosis, liquefactive necrosis, and caseous necrosis. Like I said, this will be in this lecture in part one. In subsequent lectures, we are going to cover the next three, which are gangrenous necrosis, fat necrosis, and fibrinoid necrosis. But all of these are very high yield. So with that being said, let's dive in now to the, dif the, the different types of necrosis that occur by starting off with coagulative necrosis. This is probably one of the harder ones for a lot of people to understand what's going on because it is a little bit different. It takes a second to understand what's going on. It takes a second for it to sit in, in a lot of people's brain. Um, and I know for me, it took me quite a while to really realize what's going on. So I'm gonna try to simplify it for you so uh, it's easier for you to digest. So coagulative necrosis is essentially a type of necrotic tissue that is going to be hard. Okay. So the hallmark is necrotic tissue that is still firm. So firm necrotic tissue. Now, usually this is going to occur in solid organs. And the reason why these solid organs like our heart, our kidney, or our liver go through coagulative necrosis as compared to other types of necrosis is that it allows us to preserve the cell shape by coagulating the cell proteins. And this is very important. Okay. Uh, the preservation of the cell's shape and preservation of the organ shape allows these, sor these solid organs to continue. I'm going to write this on the side so you can just remember to continue their function as best as possible. Now, it doesn't mean that the function is going to be the same as baseline before the insult or the injury occurred. It just means that they're able to continue functioning without having significant decrease or without just having to die off uh, in terms of that organ right away, unless the injury is too massive and too large, which is a different conversation. But for the most part, if it's a localized injury, our cells in that area will go through coagulative necrosis for these solid organs so that the organ can continue to function as best as possible. Now, usually this is going to occur in ischemic infarction with the exception of the brain. And the reason why is that the brain isn't really considered to be a solid organ, right? The brain is squishy. The brain is able to be moved around. It's been, it's able to uh, herniate. So therefore we're not considering the brain a uh, solid organ. 
But in majority of ischemic infarctions, you're going to see tissues undergoing coagulative necrosis, okay? Now, usually, the, the area of the infarction is going to present as a wedge-shaped wedge infarction, okay? And it's going to be pale. So if we're talking about the kidney, and this is my drawing of a kidney, okay? And here's your ureter. Okay, if we're talking about the, the kidney, in this case, this would be your right kidney, okay? And you have some sort of infarction occurring at the vascular level, you are going to see a wedge-shaped infarction that's going to be pale. Now, when it comes to the actual pathology or the mechanism behind this, is that the injury itself is going to denature the enzymes, okay? And because you're denaturing the enzymes, proteolysis is going to be blocked. So you cannot decrease your proteins, okay? And that's going to lead to a decrease in protein breakdown because the actual uh, breakdown, the actual enzymes that break down the proteins are going to be denatured. They're not able to function properly. And then this is going to allow for these proteins to then coagulate. And hence, you see coagulative necrosis occurring. Okay. So this is how I always remembered it, just so I can keep it simple in my mind. Now, when it comes to histology, because you're going to be tested on histology a lot, you need to know what coagulative necrosis is going to look like, okay? Essentially, what you're going to see in coagulative necrosis under the histology is that the cellular architecture is going to be preserved. It's not like you're going to have mass massive loss of the architecture of the cell of uh, the, the actual area that's dying off. But what you are going to start to see is that the nuclei in that location are going to start to disappear. Why is that the case? Well, we talked about this previously in our cell death lecture, where when you have cell death occurring, the process uh, is essentially the process of the nucleus disappearing from karyolysis, from karyorexis, from pycnosis, excuse me, where the nucleus shrinks, to karyorexis, where the nucleus then breaks up, to karyolysis, where the nucleus is then dissolved completely and you have a dead cell without a nucleus, right? So this is going to be the same in this case. In coagulative necrosis, the nucleus is going to disappear and you're going to have an increased cytoplasmic binding of eosin. Okay, the eof this is an eophinic excuse me, this is an, an eosinophilic resemblance. And under histology, it's going to look really red and pink color. So it's really easy for me to say all this, but it might not stick. And in order for it to stick, you need to see the histology sites. So let's look at them right here. The one on the left right here is a normal glomerulus. And you know it's normal because if we zoom in right here, you can see all of these nuclei in the glomerulus cells, right? Well, and in the tubule cells, you can see all of the nuclei. You can also see just the normal structure. I'm going to write that right here. So the normal structure of the glomerulus okay and then you have the nucleus okay so you can clearly see this is a normal looking glomerulus well let's look at the one on the right side this is a glomerulus with coagulative necrosis okay so when we look at this under histology we can still see that the architecture okay is preserved it looks pretty much like a normal gl uh, glomerulus right you see the basement membrane right here okay and you see all of this uh the the tubules right here the glomerular tubules but if you look carefully you're starting to see there are very little to no nuclei Okay, one or two here, a couple here, okay, few here, few here. But all of this area, all of this where it should be tissue, where it should be nucleus, uh, nuclei, all of these tubules, they have no nuclei. So these cells are dead cells. Therefore, this is what 
coagulative necrosis looks like. And if you look at them now side by side, you can see the significant difference between the coagulative uh, necrosis and the normal glomeruli right here. So this is what coagulative necrosis looks like under a histology. Now we're going to talk about liquefactive necrosis. Liquefactive necrosis is a type of necrosis where the tissue is going to be soft very soft okay and the name gives it away it's liquefactive it's like liquid it's it's going to be soft and and squishy that's how i really remembered it um usually this is going to occur in the opposite of coagulative necrosis instead of it happening in solid organs it's going to occur in soft organs like the brain your brain is really soft it's really squishy if you recall back from your anatomy uh lectures when you were looking at the human brain that brain was squishy. So this is what uh, is going to happen in the brain. You're going to go through liquefactive necrosis. And essentially, in this type of necrosis, enzymatic lysis of the cells and the surrounding proteins is going to cause degradation of the surrounding tissue, which is going to cause loss of the actual uh, cell structure or the uh, intra, intra not, excuse me, the extracellular uh, structure as well. Now, Usually, we're going to see this in three main instances, okay? Number one is going to be the brain infarction that we talked about in, previous, in the previous uh, in slide, where we were talking about how infarctions, ischemic infarctions, will usually lead to coagulative necrosis, except for the brain. So in the brain, when you have ischemia occurring, you are going to have a liquefactive necrosis, okay? So this is going to be different than other organs. Majority of the other organs will go through coagulative necrosis. All right. In abscesses, you are also going to have liquefactive necrosis due to enzymes from the neutrophil. Remember, an abscess is a walled off area of infection. So if there are bacteria in here, okay, and this is my drawing of bacteria. Okay. And if you have these bacteria, which are causing an infection, and you have white blood cells around here. That are releasing enzymes to kill these bacteria. Those enzymes are also going to damage our own tissue. And when that happens, you are going to see liquefactive necrosis because of the neutrophil specifically. Okay, and then we also have pancreatitis. Now, this is very important. This is very high yield because pancreatitis is a very common condition. It happens a lot. And when you go into the clinical setting, when you go into the wards and the hospitals, you're going to see so many patients who are coming in for acute pancreatitis or even chronic pancreatitis. But in pancreatitis, essentially, you're going to have uh, the pancreatic enzymes auto digesting the pancreas. And that auto digestion because of the pancreatic enzymes is going to lead to liquefactive necrosis of the pancreas pancreas itself. Very high yield, very important to understand. It's also similar to the abscess, except that in the abscess, it's, it's mediated by white blood cells releasing these enzymes. In pancreatitis, you have the pancreas being blocked in one way, whether it's a gallstone, whether it's just, you know, alcohol, um, the pancreatic duct is not able to secrete the enzymes further. And because of backflow, it can lead to the enzymes auto digesting the pancreas itself. Now, when it comes to histology, you need to know that in liquefactive necrosis, you're going to see cellular debris occurring, okay? Uh, you are also going to see a lot of macrophages as well as cystic spaces and cavitations in the brain. Now, when you're talking about abscesses, you're going to see neutrophils and cell debris along with the bacterial infection, okay? So you may or may not see an abscess depending on the clinical vignette. Now, I'm going to show you in this case uh, in terms of the liquefactive necrosis, a gross histology slide of the brain. And if you look carefully, you can actually try, you can actually see a lot of the, the concepts we just spoke about in this photo. So this right here is the normal part of the brain. Okay. Oh, let's go back. And then this also is the normal part, but this area right here is where the ischemic insult has occurred, right? And because you have an ischemic insult, not only do you have mass necrosis occurring in this region, if you look in the surrounding region, you can also see 
these uh, cystic spaces within the brain here and here and here, which you really don't see in the rest of the white matter of the brain. And the reason why that's occurring is because of all of the enzymes that are being released uh, in terms of the inflammation that's causing this type of damage to occur to the brain. So this is a hallmark example, very important example of liquefactive necrosis, okay? So now we're gonna finally finish up this lecture by discussing caseous necrosis. Caseous necrosis is essentially necrotic tissue that has a cottage cheese-like appearance, and it sounds gross because honestly, it is. There's no two ways around that. I'm not going to simplify it for you guys. So caseous necrosis, uh, the name itself gives, gives it away. Caseous sounds kind of like cheese, so it's a cheese-like necrosis that usually occurs in solid organs as well, but the interesting thing is caseous necrosis is a combination of both coagulative and liquefactive necrosis, okay? So if you had coagulative necrosis plus liquefactive necrosis, you would get caseous necrosis, okay? And when it comes to caseous necrosis, majority of the time, almost if not always for your exams, it's going to be due to an infection. Now, the common type of infection is a TB tuberculosis infection, but systemic fungi like histoplasmosa can also cause it as well as nocardia. Uh, nocardia can also lead to caseous necrosis occurring. Again, this is going to be caused by macrophages that are going to wall off the infecting organism, and essentially you're going to have this granular debris forming, which is going to be this cause cheese. This is why you have this type of infection, this type of necrosis, excuse me, because of this granular debris, all right? That's why we call it caseous. Now, when it comes to histology, you're going to see a granuloma, which is just, you know, a fragment of cells forming with debris surrounded by lymphocytes and macrophages. And if you want to see a gross image of caseous necrosis, you can see it right here. You can see the debris right here. You can see it's kind of cheese-like along with a surrounding area of debris and necrosis as well. So with that being said, that's going to cover part one of our cellular necrosis uh, lecture. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you found this useful. We're going to be talking about part two uh, and the, uh, the remaining types of cell necrosis in our upcoming lecture. Thank you so much, and we'll see you back here in the next lecture.